Welcome to your Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag. I'm Perry, this is Jeff, and somewhat sadly, I think this is the last time you'll see these beautiful faces at home base for a while. Actually, maybe not you. I think you're, you're I'm on I'm leaving a little talk. bit, li- yeah, I'm yeah, leaving a little a couple, bit later right. than you. So you'll get a, you'll get a little more uh, Jeff on the main stage, but uh, we're taking off. We're going, we're going to Toronto for a good while. Is your passport in working order? Have I, you checked the expiration date lately? <laughs> I, I made that mistake one time a long time ago for a set visit, and I panicked, and I paid a, an insane amount of money to have a new one rushed. Mm-hmm. So, and also the fact that I was just in Mexico for the nine, it was extra, Perry extra doesn't safe. miss assignments. She would rather pay through the nose to fix the passport situation than say, you know what, I can't make it. You know what's funny is I think I might have paid that money for the shit. Uh, I might have paid that money for the, the set visit to Monster Trucks. Wow, that is dedication <laughs> to the sure profession. I'm pretty sure that's that's the movie it was for. That was fun set visit. I never even wound up seeing the movie. <laughs> did you get to wait? Did you get to drive a monster truck? I wish I that I didn't get cool. to drive a monster truck, but they had what did they wind up calling the monster in the movie? If you think I saw a monster so truck, we you're set, sorely mistaken. <laughs> when we were on set, the monster truck, the main one, was called Big Ugly, and it was it was almost like like a giant you know like RC controller thing where they had a controller and they were able to pick the car up and have it like shake your hand with its wheel so we did that we never even got any of those photo op pictures Man, now that i'm thinking I, about it i gotta go on cooler set visits i guess <laughs> sometimes it's fun though to go on set visits for for properties that are like brand new rather than the superhero movies that way you go in and you learn something completely new right, rather, rather than, than just you're grilling like trying to them point about... out all the easter eggs oh exactly. look at that that could mean that it is kind of refreshing every once in a while yeah. um before we veer too far off course here this is mailbag you know how to send questions in Twitter, Facebook, email. What am I forgetting? Instagram. I'm forgetting Instagram. That email, if you need it, is mailbag at collider.com. And as always, I must remind you to tell your friends, family, everybody out there that Mailbag doesn't only exist in video form. We have a podcast as well. We are on the Collider Movie Talk feed. So iTunes, Podcast One app, check it out. Ready? Let's do this, Perry. All righty. We have a Twitter question here to kick us off today. This is from Guy Rock FL, who writes, How do the folks at Collider schedule celebrities for interviews? Do they reach out to you when they are promoting a new project? What is that process like? Thanks for taking my question. Well, I think it's different for every reporter uh, at Collider. I know that nobody reaches out to me anymore. (laughs) They used to. Now I have to be the one who reaches out. I have to call their publicist or manager or agent, um, unless I have a relationship with the talent directly for some reason, if they follow me on Twitter or something like that. Um, But yeah, I'll I'll typically go through the proper channels or even the studio to request an interview. you know, I'm going to be doing the up and comer of the month uh, feature on dot com. Uh, we had searching star Michelle Law was the August uh, subject, and uh, I, I have a request in for a, you know a September subject, but we have to wait and see if uh, if she says yes. Hmm, I'm curious to see who you went for. Uh, do check that out though. I love the idea for that piece. Um, it also depends, you know, where you're interviewing the talent. Like for example, when we go to Toronto, the way that worked is. A lot of times when you get accredited for a film festival, your email goes on this like master list and then the studios or, you know, some of the, the smaller firms will go through that list and say, we want that person for the junk at that person. And they'll make a big email list and then they'll send a big blast out with all the basic information you put in your request. You are either approved or you are not. And then you get to cover it. But life. Like uh, you just said, you know, sometimes when you have uh, personal relations with people or you know or they know that you're really into a specific something, they'll reach out to you specifically. Like a lot of times with anything right. horror related, they'll right. people they'll, are coming to you because they know that you're interested. They'll in either come to me directly or they'll name drop me in in an email to Steve or something right. like that. So I think it's just a uh, a case by case basis. But curious, what is what's your favorite interview you've ever done? That's that's tough to say. There's so many memorable ones, uh, and it depends on you know like wh- how old I was. Like, but I, I think that the Robin Williams interview I did it for this Ooh. this terrible movie. I was doing it for the NYU paper. Did you write for the NYU paper? I wrote for the NYU paper for one semester, and okay. then I joined a sorority, and all of my extracurriculars went out the window. Oh wow! <laughs> Eric Cohn at IndieWire was my editor at the really? time. Yeah, Lane Brown was there. It's it's pretty so funny. Fun. But um, Robin Williams for this movie House of D that David Duchovny directed. Uh, and, and I don't think Robin Williams answered a single question. So, like, in, in that sense, he's actually, like, maybe the worst interview I've ever done. <laughs> but he just, 
his, 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 jo his job was just to like keep everybody laughing during that 15 minute slot. You don't even like think about how he hasn't answered a question yet. He's just going off on these tangents and yeah, it was wonderful. If that's the reason it, it like is a bad interview, I think I would take that. I think the, the worst interview I've ever had was I got a, I got, all right, I'm just not a big Tim and Eric fan. I'm, I'm just not. I know I'm there's, there's folks out there who love their humor. I do not. And when Tim and Eric's billion dollar movie came out, I got a 20 minute one on one with them and you know me I go in like prepped to the T I've got all of my interesting filmmaking questions and I'm trying to keep a straight face the entire time and I was warned that they were going to mess with me so I went in semi prepared uh -huh. so I was joking around for five minutes but after 20 minutes of talking to the two of them about how they were sitting there baking bread under their hats like I was just pulling my hair out I could not wait to get out of that room but I I just I, like I can't interview people whose work I don't appreciate or admire like I, I don't know how to like put on a fake face and ask them about their project that I thought was terrible. I wouldn't I say I've it. ever put on a fake face, but I'm, I'm usually always able to find I didn't mean it like that. Yeah, like, yeah. Cause I know you have to be professional. Obviously, I, you know, if somebody offered me a moderating gig for a movie, I didn't like, yeah. you know, I would still take that gig, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I but, think I mean more like I'll always manage, like, even if I don't like a movie, I'll always manage to find like one truly redeeming quality or some, you can or find something, something to, to focus about. on. Exactly. Um, That's my why best, Perry's though, a professional. Sometimes. My best, though, is definitely when Guillermo del Toro came into the studio. I think that was, like, hands down one of the one of my most favorite interview conversations I've ever had. Yeah, he's, um, he's a good interview. He's wonderful. Uh, question two? You want to take us into that? Yes, one? Tom. An email from Tom <laughs> writes, you guys are going to TIFF, so what are you looking forward to? What are your top five most anticipated of the fest, please? I'm finding that my top five is changing every single day when I start to hear good word of mouth, see a new trailer, sure. um, anything like that. Get the but, reviews out of Venice and yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really starting to, to get in my head. But right now, I would say Halloween is, uh, is at the top of my list. Okay. I am beyond thrilled about that. I will be at the midnight screening. You're going to get all the reviews for that one. Um, number two is The Hate You Give. I'm doing the junket for that one, so I started to listen to the audiobook, and uh, that's... that's that's one I've heck of a things. powerful book. Um, number three is Can You Ever Forgive Me, especially after Happy Time Murders, because mm -hmm. I'm always like <laughs> uh, just applauding Melissa McCarthy, because I do feel like even when I really don't like her movies, I can always see just the talent and the charisma oozing off of her. And I'm just dying for the day, or at least this year in particular, because she's done some great, like I love Spy and St. Vincent. This is her first big, like dramatic thing. Like obviously she was good in, in St. Vincent, but that's yeah. a Bill Murray movie. Exactly. Like this is a Melissa movie. And this this could be a, a pretty big game changer, I think, for her, especially yeah. for, for all the naysayers that don't like her comedies. And you know, she, she's 0 for 2 in my mind in terms of the overall quality of her movies this year. Big, so I want this to change. It's a big role for Richard E. Grant too. Yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to that. He could, I'm he could psyched show up for that. Uh, later this award season we'll see i'm curious uh for old man and the gun i love that trailer i'm yeah, really excited to uh to cover that junket as well because those are some bucket list stars i'm going to talk to there and then uh right now at number five i have a stars born because i think that that could be one oh, that the goes buzz the is so good uh yeah. i i have two of the same halloween and a star is born absolutely also uh karen kasama's destroyer yes. with nicole kidman obviously pumped about that one first man with ryan gosling and yep. beautiful boy with steve carell and timothy chalamet i think looks uh, pretty interesting well, it's a solid list right there why am i getting booted off our internet not that i need it i have all my notes right here boom it's fine. number three it's all fine I just can keep getting hit with like it's trying to get me to log into other things. Poor Nathan. Now I can, now I can't see Nathan's email, but now I have it. Nathan writes, "Hello, have you ever had to stop watching a movie because it was too intense or frightening? I love horror movies, but something about funny games struck such a powerful chord that I had to leave it unfinished. Thank you guys for all you do." First of all, Nathan, my man, you got to go back and finish Funny Games. I mean, that movie has a great ending. Um, yes, there was one movie that I turned off okay. because it was just too crazy, too insane for my little teenage brain to handle. It was called Evil Dead. The, the Evil really? Dead. Excuse me. The Evil Dead. Uh, Sam huh. Raimi's original movie. Uh, and yeah, How old that, were you when you saw that? I must have been 12, maybe. Okay. Something like that. And it was just so... It feels so raw and like gritty, that movie. Because, you know? Like it doesn't... It's, it, it's, it's not like polished. You know? It feels like it could be real. And some of like the, the creatures in that just oh, freaked me out. <laughs> 
I like that answer. Um, the only horror movie I've ever turned off out of fear is fear it's not really even a horror movie but the mark Wahlberg movie yeah yeah I wow just, so uh, i guess a minor spoiler for fear i vividly remember i, I was having a, about, i was I having think. a sleepover with a friend and it was like the middle of the night and it was one of those movies where like my parents never stopped me from watching anything but if they knew we were up watching that in the middle of the night they'd probably be like well you shouldn't do that mm -hmm. sure enough it hits a point in the movie where there is a dog and the dog's head is chopped off and it's put through the doggy door and the second the head falls through the doggy door like the two of us screamed because we're both big dog lovers screamed at the, the top moment. of our lungs ran to the tv and shut it off i but, knew that would be the moment Perry. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's typically things like that but otherwise yeah. even if something is really freaking me out odds are i'll just make myself suffer until it's over um that's a good answer too all right uh number four eric Oof, get Let's ready get, for this we, one we need some more uh female questionnaires we do we do hey okay, ladies, ladies out there right in Send come on in. i'll answer whatever you want doesn't have to be about movies either uh eric <laughs> email ethan hawk recent oh right this is the bit this, this is the big, big topic yeah, yeah. here all right here we go Ethan Hawke recently joined Team Bash comic book movies, and it had me wondering why people feel so strongly that one version of, of professional make-believe like these movies are any less valuable than a drama or a comedy. I could understand the frustration if a film like Fantastic Four was as messy and bad as it was and ridiculed by critics, yet still made nearly a nearly billion dollars. Whether it's that franchise or Transformers or the Dark Universe or even DC movies, I think moviegoers have proven quality of film matters if you want to continue growing box office returns. Yet still we have a James Cameron or a Mel Gibson of all people dismissing comic book movies that are well received by fans and professional critics. I just don't understand the need to dismiss a successful genre of film just because it's not trying to accomplish the same thing as something like Room or Moonlight. Yeah. Um, fire. <laughs> Eric, I, bring in the fire. I definitely uh, fall on the side of the divide that says it's it's not fair to do that and i think it mirrors some of the discussions we've had with the the problems at the academy just you know let's say superhero movies and horror movies it is more challenging for them to kind of break through the pack of oscar packages and actually earn an award even though maybe they are deserving of it and yeah, the, these these comments you know he's entitled to his opinion i'm not knocking him for we that all are. but but my my opinion is just not that. I think movies like Logan and this year Black Panther are well deserving to be amongst the other best picture contenders. Like, you know, in past years, let's say like Room Rumor Moonlight. I think all of these movies are great and I kind of I'm just really excited about the whole idea of, you know, I expanding the pool of uh of Academy Award potentials, particularly because I feel like we're finally hitting a point where we're seeing more more major blockbuster releases that cost an insane amount of money that are actually using that money and their talent to great effect where they're not just making something to make a lot of money, but they're making good films. They're making good films that not only tell a good immediate story in the context of that specific movie, but they, they reverberate beyond the movie and beyond that specific experience in really special ways. So these comments don't feel fair to me, but it's just my opinion. Um... I, at the same time, understand Ethan Hawke's frustration. I think it's with how much attention these movies get. Um, but I do think he came off very pretentious and elitist in that interview. Um, it is complicated, though. I don't think it, it is a cut and dry thing. Guys, keep in mind, like, I love The Crow. Uh, the Crow is one of my favorite movies. And I think that's because that superhero or antihero has personal stakes. Uh, I think that stakes are important, and it can't always just be the fate of the universe. Um, you know, Logan is a great movie. You know, he, and he pointed out Logan as one of these movies too. Like, I think that was a poor example for Ethan yeah. Hawke to choose because uh, Logan really did transcend its genre. Something like Infinity War, where, where people come out of that calling that a great movie. I think Ethan Hawke is right. I, I don't understand how it's a great movie at all. Like Avengers Infinity War, it, that that blows my mind that, that, that people will like actually like look back on this year and that, that'll be their favorite movie. Um, but at the same time, I think Black Panther was better than First Reformed, you know? So I just don't know that Ethan Hawke, especially given some of the paycheck roles that he takes from time to time, I, I don't know that he is... Uh, 
allowed to talk. Yeah. I'll put it that way. One of the things that I often think of is, and uh, Logan is a good example of this, is when you take out the superhero elements of it and the movie can still stand on its own two feet. And I think that's a great example of a movie that does. But, you know, you could also flip Ethan Hawke's argument on its head and apply it to movies that are Oscar packages as we report on them and the, everything comes together. You could say, oh, that's Oscar bait right now. It's going to go the distance and actually get a nomination when it comes out and you know just I've seen time and time again movies come together that seem like the perfect Oscar contender and they wind up and sucking. they're worse than a lot of comic book movies yeah. I totally understand that um, you're right it goes both ways uh, I, I I think that comic book movies are starting to get their due from the industry at large I think that there will be a comic book movie nominated for best picture this year I think Black Panther has a really good shot um, yeah you know, and again, I didn't mean to say that Ethan Hawke is not allowed to talk because everybody is allowed to talk. Uh, and we need to hear a bunch of opinions on this because I don't think it is a cut and dried thing. But yeah, I, 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 the way that those comments were interpreted, I could see like the negative spin on so what he was saying. Just to address the title of this mailbag specifically, why do you think this is happening? Is it, is it simply be, because of the, the frustration of not being able to make enough noise in the industry against these major temple movies? I think that is that is certainly part of it. Yes, so, like nobody cares anymore about how well done Ethan Hawke's you know movie Blaze is. Like that thing just came and went in theaters. I, I actually saw a trailer when I went to see We the Animals last Thursday night, um, and I was like, I, I would I'd be down to see this movie Blaze. It's already in theaters. I didn't even know that, and it's probably going to be gone by the time I get a chance to see it. Um, so I understand again, like I said, why Ethan Hawke is frustrated, mm -hmm. but. I, I, they are being taken seriously, just maybe not as seriously as some of the fans take it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I can uh, understand from that that perspective too. I wouldn't be a, a surprised too if some of the some of the folks out there who have been outspoken against superhero movies, maybe that's coming from a place of taste. Also, if if they're not into it, they're not into it, and that could drive that kind of comment too. And and that's also fair because they're entitled to their their own opinion and whatever movies they're into. The, the more of these Marvels, uh, Marvel movies that get made, right, the more people in the industry Marvel ends up employing, mm -hmm. right. And and that the, the the academy is the industry. So if you end up employing half the academy because you get to crank out three Marvel movies a year going forward, like you know that's how you get taken seriously. And then you add all the Fox stuff that they own, and then it gets even bigger. Right, Before and everybody's you know it, voting Disney for Disney. The world. Exactly. That, I mean, that oh, is wow, true. Oh, wow, that ended in a disturbing place. Let's move on to the last question for the day. This is a Twitter question from A Hill Far Away. Good, writes, good handle, Perry. <laughs> if you could pick five movies to define your childhood, what would they be? Mine are pretty fluid, and I could probably do ten, but my picks would be Star Wars, Goonies, Princess Bride, Dazed and Confused, and Empire Records. Oh, Pressure's okay. on. Oh, well, I wrote a, a little handy list here, and I did have 10. Of I, course, I it's it's on one of your yellow post-its. My post-its. Post I've got a lot of post-its here. <laughs> Guys, there's so many. First of all, in fact, this quote right here, this is from Angus. You ever see Angus. I love Angus. I haven't thought about that movie in so long. That's one of so my childhood long. faves. Uh, Home Alone, obviously. Yeah. Uh, oh. Perry's shirt there, Jurassic Park. Right? Of course. Uh, American Pie was a big one. That's okay. like, I'm, I'm like 15 at American Pie, so we're getting a little bit older. Yeah. Uh, Scream, obviously. Um, how about It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown? Do you remember watching that as a kid? I do remember watching it, and it, you know, you would watch it every single yeah, year. Yeah, I love I was, that. I was never really as into it. Not as, a big as Peanuts kind of gal? I mean, a little bit. Actually, more so than anything, I just used to read the, the comic strips. Growing, oh, okay. up, growing up, that was a big thing for me, is every morning I read almost all of the comic strips. I, I, I read the funnies. Very, very into that. Um, okay, how about the, the, uh, the Fred Savage movies, The Wizard? No, I've never seen The Wizard. Really? Wow, what about Little Monsters? Yeah, I've seen Little Monsters. I used but, to love Little Monsters yeah. so much. Uh, is there any more? I mean, yeah, like Empire Records can't hardly yeah. wait. And I have to say Copycat, which was the first R-rated movie. Oh, boy. That, that I got to see at 11 <laughs> years old, alone. Uh, uh, 
I can't remember the first R-rated movie I probably saw. Is Killer Clowns from Outer Space rated R? I'm sure it was. Yeah. But, but I'm not talking about like watching, you know, watching on cable or like get a VHS, like going to the theater. What going was your the- first R-rated movie you're, that you're going to see in the theater? Um, that I saw without in the a parent. theater. Without, well, without a parent, that's a different story. I mean, it was probably... Uh, it's probably one of the the slasher movies because my mom took me to see Scream, and then after that I got obsessed. And for some reason, I'm flashing forward to. I, she would I, go I, with you though. Yeah, I. She wouldn't just. Buy, did she ever just buy you the ticket and then leave you for a couple hours and then come back? She would. She There's de- there's instances that aren't coming to mind right now, but I was allowed to see and do whatever sure. I wanted. So there's no doubt she did that at some point. I'm just point, like but tr- trying to picture you like going to see like Urban Legend, and your mom's getting I, like dragged to see it. I probably. I, well, she loves it too. My whole okay. family is super into horror. Like that I explains am. Explains mean, so you, much. You know, the last time I went home, we all went and saw. We all willingly saw Slenderman together. Nobody. <laughs> nobody left. Liked it, but we all wanted to go because we were curious. Oh my god! <laughs> um, so my list is actually similar: Scream and Jurassic Park. Okay. Without a doubt, on my list, it did pain me a little to read a hell far oh, away like suggestion of Days and Confused and Empire Records and not put those on because it feels a little later in life when I, I appreciate know. like sixteen. It wasn't really childhood. I, would I watched say. a lot of Empire Records. Um, I, I would definitely put uh, Nightmare Before Christmas on my list. Love that. That was a movie where it came out and I got obsessed with it, where I basically, you know, I sought out every single individual in my family and convinced them to take me. So before I knew it, I had seen it like 10 Were times. Were you a Hot with... Topic kind of gal, Perry? Not really. Okay. Uh, you know, I, if I go to Hot Topic, it, it's more like now. Like sometimes I'll go in and buy a Funko or, okay. or like a, a T-shirt or something, but I was never that I into Hot it. Topic. Anyways, um, what else you I got? Would also Add Stand By Me. Great movie. Stand By Me, uh, I've got an obsession with. And a big one for me growing up is Billy Madison. Speaking of parents taking you to see You're movies, right. I don't think that my parents really knew what they were getting into when mm. we went to see Billy Madison. And it's like, we went as a family, so my sister was even younger than me. And it's just like, you sit in five minutes of that movie. And when you haven't seen anything like that before, your reaction has to be like, what is this nonsense? But we loved it and grew up repeating those lines for better or worse over and over and over. I can still recite that movie from That's start to finish. That's a great call. You know, I didn't have enough comedy on mine I, I like because I did worship uh, Sandler back yeah. then Jim Carrey with Ace Ventura yeah. oh, and, Ace and Mike Ventura Myers big one. like those three guys were, were very special to me as a kid so mm, I, I, I like your list all right we, we can share these two lists there seems to be a lot of crossover here anyway uh, that's it that's yeah, that'll do it for mailbag. This edition of Collider Mailbag. So again, you guys know if you watched yesterday's episode, I will not be here for the next two weeks. But John Roke is going to step in. Stuck with me for in. a little while. Well, actually, no, you're not going to be on the show for the next two weeks either. Oh yeah. You're, you're going to get a little uh, a little Jeff Snyder on uh, movie talk before he hits, he hits the road for TIFF. But uh, John Roko will be steering the ship for me. So send him some questions. Don't forget to use that hashtag Collider Mailbag. So he he doesn't miss them. You'll also get Riley and Dennis. So do enjoy those episodes. Thank you for watching this one. And we'll see you soon in Toronto. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now. And share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.